Stand by while NCLA cuts through the noise to signal abuse of administrative power. This is Administrative Static with Mark Chenoweth and John Vecchione. Welcome to Administrative Static. Mark Chenoweth and John Vecchioni with you as always, and we are delighted to have back with the program Senior Litigation Counsel Rich Samp from the New Civil Liberties Alliance. Rich, welcome to Administrative Static. It's my pleasure to be here. And Rich is with us because uh, he has been the lead attorney now for a while on the Cargill v. Garland case that NCLA has been litigating uh, and was uh, successful in oral argument in front of the en banc uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit for the first time convincing uh, an en banc federal court to strike down the bump stock ban. And I guess that the Department of Justice wasn't very happy with that outcome, Rich, because they've now filed a cert petition with the Supreme Court to try to reverse that result. They have filed that. <clears throat> and just this past week, a group of uh, gun control advocates filed a uh, brief in the Supreme Court, an amicus curiae brief, uh, asking that the petition be granted. And, and to me, it's curious that the gun control advocates, really on either side of this issue, are are getting uh, as involved as they are. Maybe I shouldn't be surprised. There's a lot of enthusiasm around the Second Amendment on both sides of the question. But this isn't really a Second Amendment case, is it? No, this has to do with the interpretation of a federal statute. Federal law since 1986 has banned possession of machine guns. And what the uh, ATF held in the year 2018 was that a bump stock turns a semi-automatic rifle into a machine gun. That was a reversal of a long-standing rule, and it's been our position all along, as confirmed by the uh, Court of Appeals, uh, that's simply not what the law says. Right. So what is the government's position now in seeking sort of what's the question that they're wanting the court uh, to resolve? They simply are asking the court to resolve what the definition of a machine gun is under federal law. They point out quite correctly that there have been a number of different courts that have arrived at conflicting decisions. At the moment, three federal appeals courts have supported our position, that, which is that the old interpretation of law by ATF was the correct one and that bump stocks are not machine guns. Uh, two courts of appeals, uh, uh, on the other hand, have held that they are machine guns, and that's the role of the Supreme Court to try to resolve conflicts of this sort. That's right, because since your victory in the Fifth Circuit, the Sixth Circuit recently handed down a, a decision on this same question. Right. The Sixth Circuit came down our way so that there is now the Fifth, the Sixth, and a military appeals court that have ruled our way. Uh, the Federal Appeals Court here in the District of Columbia, as well as the Tenth Circuit out in Denver, have ruled the other way. Right. So in that, in that Tenth Circuit case, uh, to remind our, our viewers in Colorado, is the Apotian v. Uh, Garland case. I guess not viewers, our listeners in, in Colorado. <laughs> you don't want to see this show, believe me. But, uh, uh, but uh, the Apotian v. Garland case in the Tenth Circuit, and, uh, and that case is back in the, in the district court right now, where uh, Rich is also litigating that one. But for now, we'll focus on the, on the Supreme Court uh, situation. So where are we in the process? You say that the cert petition has been filed, the folks supporting a grant of cert have now filed Mika's briefs in support of, of cert. When, when will you be filing. It's called a brief in opposition, but you're not required to oppose the cert grant, I suppose. That's correct. Our brief is due on June the 7th, and in fact, uh, you're correct. We don't intend to oppose it. Uh, this is the sort of situation where the Supreme Court almost automatically grants review because there is a conflict as to the meaning of a federal law and a federal agency's interpretation has been struck down. So we think it's appropriate that at a minimum the court agree to hear this statutory issue, although we would like them to broaden the issues that they're going to hear somewhat. Uh, and in what way would you like them to broaden the issues? What do you think that they failed to raise in the cert petition? 
Well, the, one of the things that a majority of the uh, judges on the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit said was that, first of all, we, we think that the, the, the statute clearly says that bump stocks are not machine guns. But even if one were to reach the conclusion that the statute is somewhat ambiguous, what the Fifth Circuit said was ambiguous criminal statutes are supposed to be interpreted in favor of the criminal and against the government. The accused, the accused. (laughs) Exactly. In favor of the accused uh, uh, against the government. The, uh, The rule of lenity basically says that if the government wants to put somebody in jail for violating a crime, it better in advance make it very clear exactly what the crime is so that people can know how to behave. And therefore, that's appropriate when a uh, statute is somewhat uh, ambiguous, that the ambiguity be be uh, interpreted in favor of the, of the accused. And so we are going to ask the Supreme Court to uh, to look at what the standards are for invoking the rule of lenity. And, and there's at least two things that come to mind when you when you talk about that. First is that this is a principle that we see throughout the law. In contract law, for example, you tend to draft ambiguous provisions against the drafter uh, of the contract, whichever of the two sides drafted it. They don't get the benefit of the interpretation. Here, the government's the one who's writing the laws, so they don't get the benefit of the ambiguous interpretation. It's, it's pretty similar. The second thing that I thought you might want to talk about briefly is, even though this is a civil case, because our client is not accused of having done anything uh, criminally wrong, uh, it's the same statute that applies in both the civil and the criminal context here. And I guess that means the law has to be interpreted the same in both contexts. That's correct. And in fact, this really is the criminal context. The law that bans uh, uh, machine guns is almost exclusively applicable to criminal situations. Uh, Mr. Cargill, for, for some time before the ban went into effect, had owned two bump stocks. He was ordered to immediately turn it over to ATF. If he had failed to do so, he would have been subject to uh, imprisonment for up to 10 years. So this really is a criminal case. And, and the, the, case, the case in front of the, uh, the Military Court of Appeals, that actually was a criminal case, right? Right. That was a member of the Marine Corps who was found to possess a bump stock, and he was... Uh, uh, sentenced to several years in military prison until he was able to get his conviction overturned. Right. So, uh, so June seventh is when the the so called brief in opposition will be uh, will be filed. Although it won't really be opposing uh, opposing cert. So, folks who uh, who are on your side of the question, will they be weighing in at the cert stage, or will they be waiting for the the merit stage to weigh in? They are certainly welcome to if they want. We are not necessarily encouraging them to do so. Uh, we would love to have supporters. Keep their powder dry, so right. to speak. We would love supporters uh, when and if the Supreme Court grants review, which, as I said before, I think it's very likely they will do. The Supreme Court is off for the summer so that our uh, brief will be coming too late uh, for the Supreme Court to rule on the petition this uh, spring and summer. Uh, rather, the court will decide at the very end of September whether to hear the case. I suspect they will. At that point, the parties will file uh, a new round of briefs, and at that point, we expect that, that uh, the many supporters of, uh, of uh, the rule of law, as well as gun rights, will be weighing in in support of us, and it's likely the case will be argued in January of 2024. Terrific. And then a decision would be handed down, say, by June of 2024? No, later than June. I would like to think this is an easy case, and that unanimous <laughs> these cases uh, tend to be decided fairly quickly, so it could be before then, but well, no later. Although the rate they're going, this, this terms may still be being written. <laughs> I've, I've been slow. I was going to say, so far, NCLA has, uh, has an unblemished 9 or no record at the, at the Supreme Court, so... Uh, we try to try to keep that up. Uh, well, is there anything else you want to point out about the case, Rich, or that, that you think our listeners might be interested in? Well, unfortunately, with all of this litigation going on, it means that people like Mr. Cargill uh, have had to wait for years to get their property back. And uh, 
the proceedings in the district court where the case uh, should have returned after the Fifth Circuit uh, uh, ruled, uh, that case has been stayed pending re review of this Supreme Court petition so that uh, in the meantime, nobody has gotten a bump stock back yet from ATF, but I'm hoping soon. And most people it, who follow the law, they turn it in and it was destroyed, right? And so there's only some people who actually have a bump stock being held by ATF. I don't know the oh. exact number. Mr. Cargill did get an agreement from ATF that they would hold on to it and return it. Um, whether or not that agreement was arrived at with all of the hundreds of thousands of owners of bump stocks, I don't know. If they were destroyed, I would say that those particular individuals would probably have a pretty good claim against the government for compensation. Yeah, you would, you would think so. We might have to, to come back to that uh, question down the road because I know there have been some cases pending on that. Uh, is, there a, uh, you know, is, there a, is there a particular uh, concern you have, Rich, about uh, uh, the rule of lenity coming up in this context, or do you think this, is a, this case presents the issue well? Well, the rule of lenity doesn't apply if a statute is clear one way or the other. And so part of the uh, disconnect in this case is that both the government and our side agree that the, the statute is absolutely clear. We just have opposing <laughs> ideas about uh, what the clear statute is. So that if we prevail and the Supreme Court says, yes, the statute is clear, then there would be no reason for the court to get into whether the rule of lenity applies here. And of course, there's another issue that's kind of the flip side of the rule of lenity, which is Chevron deference. Uh, several of the courts that have upheld the bump stock rule have said, yeah, we think it's ambiguous, but uh, we think that ambiguity should go in favor of the government under Chevron deference. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for being with us, Rich. Good luck. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, Mark and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, a constitutional matter that has arrived on whether the um, administrative, the executive, can unilaterally raise the debt limit. And this theory that has been bruited about recently is that the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, one of the Civil War Amendments, uh, means that the president can raise the debt limit anytime he likes because the debts of the United States cannot be repudiated. And, and uh, I'm relying, uh, I've been looking at this a little myself, but um, much of what I'll rely on is from Dan McLaughlin of National Reviews, uh, an excellent article, The 14th Amendment Doesn't Empower Biden to Borrow Beyond the Debt Limit from the May 10th, 2023 National Review. And um, I want to just read the 14th Amendment just so you're all on the same page with me as I discuss it. The validity of the public debt of the United States, comma, authorized by law, includes debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounty for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion, comma, shall not be questioned. Um, but neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States or any claim for the loss or emancipation of any slave, semicolon, but all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. So what's going on here? Well, they want to pay Union soldiers, and as it says over at the Veterans Administration, their wives and their children, uh, and they don't want to pay... Wid widows and orphans, I believe. Exactly. Widows and orphans. There you go. Um, and they don't want Confederate money or Confederate debts to be paid by any state that comes back into the Union or any um, or the federal government should the um, the uh, 
South get control of the uh, Congress again. Freeing the slaves doesn't create a taking. Correct. That's what they're saying here. So, um, and this was all hotly contested before the war, but you win the war and you put in your amendments, and it, this, 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 and the other uh, Civil War amendments just uh, clarified and and um, and uh, fixed problems that had been around from before the war and saw and 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 put an end to certain legal disputes. What they did not do is create a power in the executive to just raise the debt limit. And I'll, I'll just say one historical matter. The, the Congresses that were passing these amendments were in huge, huge fights with Andrew Johnson. They were not going to give Andrew Johnson the power to raise debts. So uh, uh, Dan McLaughlin doesn't mention that, but the, the idea that the radical Republicans were giving the president the power to unilaterally raise debts so they could do things that they weren't didn't want to do is an insane proposition if you if you even just look at that period of time. But uh, there's there's almost unanimity up until the day before yesterday on this question. Uh, Larry Tribe is quoted extensively in this article, and Larry Tribe is not considered an originalist, but he goes, he explains very, very clearly uh, why the founders at first, uh, taking from the British, wanted Congress to control all taxing and all spending. That's really how they were going to control the government. That that power of the purse was the main thing that they were going to control the government. And um, if they couldn't do that, as in France, the, the, the king never had to call the parliament at all. He could just ignore them. Bismarck set up the German Empire that way, and and Dan points that out here. That it was well, so. Don't forget King Charles in England. Yeah, exactly. So so um, this is how it was. This is how it was. Um, Congress was set up, and so the the Civil War amendments aren't going to change that. But I'll just look at the look at the wording. The validity of the public debt of the United States, comma authorized by law. Comma. So what's authorized by law? That means that Congress has said, yeah, we're we're paying that. And and what this does, one of the reasons that the credit of the United States is so great is that they can't repudiate. There's a constitutional prohibition on repudiating debt that has already been um, incurred. incurred. But what there is not is they can stop it. Congress can stop incurring debt anytime it likes. It can just say no more. And then uh, spending stops and all this. And now that would have catastrophic uh, um, um, outcome. But they're allowed to. Well, do it depends it. how much of the spending they stop. That that is that is true. They stop all spending. It's well, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. They could just go to zero sometimes. If they could just stop all the unconstitutional spending, I think we'd be in pretty good shape. <laughs> so what he, what they do is so so. What is the theory here? Well, the theory here is is that because um, we can't repudiate our debt, and because I guess there's interest. That uh, that the president can unilaterally do this, um, but uh, but I, I just want to quote a little of Lawrence Tribe, which will be a first on this on this <laughs> podcast, um, and might maybe a last. <laughs> he says that uh, so uh, so he's he, Dan is is uh, contrasting uh, people who argue for this a fellow named Garrett Epps. He argues that Biden will have failed in his duties, quote, if the president obeys the debt ceiling, because, you know, you have to pay the obligations of the United States. Tribe argues for, quote, ignoring the debt ceiling until Congress either raises or abolishes it. But the debt ceiling is not a limit on Biden's power. It is a grant of power to go beyond it. Biden would be acting entirely outside the powers of his office. Tribe further argues that, quote, Proponents say that when Congress enacted the debt limit, it built a violation of that constitutional command into our fiscal structure, and that as a result, that limit and all that followed are invalid. And then Dan says, but the authorization of the debt, which is what the, quote, limit is, was invalid. That doesn't mean that there is no limit. It means the debt itself was invalidly issued. That is the conclusion the 14th Amendment does not permit. So... Um, what, and Tribe adds that, quote, the right question is whether Congress, after passing the spending bills that created these debts in the first place, can invoke an arbitrary dollar limit to force the president and his administration to do its bidding. Uh, there is only one right answer to that question, and that is no, says Tribe. OK, so that's where he differs from Dan. But that is but but Dan and, and me 
and probably Mark say, but that is precisely what Madison expected Congress to do. That is the power of the purse. That's exactly what what the founders wanted. They they wanted Congress to make the administrative the administration do certain things if they wanted to by using the power of the purse. Well, and, and think about what this would mean if tribe is right. It means that if one Congress does something crazy and runs up a whole bunch of spending, and then the American people have a you know, within the next two years, there's an election. They hire new House representatives. They're, that, they're saying that House can't go in and undo that spending if the president wants to go ahead and spend all the money that the last Congress appropriated. Right. That can't be right. Right. And, 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 and that, is, that is what's going on here. The one aspect of this that I find confusing is interest, right? So you can't repudiate the debt. Interest is running. You have notes and things. You have obligations under this interest. So what happens? I, I think what happens there is is that is that the interest becomes prioritized by the Constitution. It could be, which could cause enormous problems. So well, the, I don't know that it causes enormous problems. That happens. It's already prioritized now. Fifteen to twenty percent of all federal spending is service on the debt, and it is prioritized now. Right. That doesn't change. Well, so just keep paying that and stop paying other things if you need to. I I, I understand, but that I stop paying the ALJs and uh, the administrative. But that, yeah, exactly. But that is the sort of thing that causes revolutions. And I always notice in other countries that don't have this, that's exactly what happens. There's a huge fight over what to pay first, and then sometimes there is a a push over these things. But I do think that the real the real aspect of the 14th Amendment here is that both by its language, you know, authorized by Congress and by the original Federalist Papers of what Congress is supposed to be doing with its spending and, and taxing powers. Because the taxing and debt, everything has to be paid for. It's either paid by present taxation or by debt. That's the, there's nothing else, I don't believe, that can pay uh, anything. And so uh, both those powers are within Article One. They're not anywhere else. You can read Article Two and, and Lord knows Article Three everywhere. And this is why one of uh, there was a big big brouhaha when a federal court out i think it was in kansas mark i'm just not sure but he ordered all of this spending in kansas uh, city missouri maybe yes. for the for the school district yep. is that what you're thinking yep. about? and there were all kinds of challenges that wait a second he, he's allowed to say you can't discriminate here or you can't do this or enjoin or what but he can't order spending and 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 that was even an Article Three court with all the immense powers to order things to to fix a unconstitutional violation. He couldn't do that. Yeah, this was late eighties, maybe early nineties. Right. And so I also think that uh, that I think this is probably a, a bluff. Um, I was asked today on on Twitter by a, a Georgetown uh, guy. Well, who could sue? Well, the Congress could sue. The House could sue. They could sue to 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 um, vindicate their Article One powers. Well, and the House has already passed a bill to raise the debt ceiling. That's John. true. So, right, the, the president can't just not sign a bill and then act unilaterally because he doesn't like the bill that the House passed. That's right, not, and make up make up a power because yeah. I mean he can't veto the bill, I suppose. Sure, but, but that has consequences, and so does. I mean, right now what they're trying to do, I suppose, politically is if 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 they don't raise the debt ceiling and all kinds of terrible things, they want to they want to be like that that meme of the Spider Man pointing fingers at the other Spider Man. They, they basically it's who to blame. Hey, I know where you can find a half a trillion dollars in spending. <laughs> they uh, they canceled a bunch of student loan debt that was unconstitutional, and the Supreme Court is going to strike that down within the next month. And when it does, we've just bought ourselves half a trillion dollars worth of more space before the debt ceiling is 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 hit. It's found money. It is. So apparently the judiciary can help in this situation, John. <laughs> I wonder if they count that. Do you think that's counted? Well, they already counted it in the September. Uh, they, they, they counted that half a trillion dollars in the last fiscal year. Wow. On the books. Yeah, last September. So take it off the books. Take that half trillion off. We've got more, more space to work with. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, uh, I, so I don't think this is going to fly. I do recommend to everyone. I almost always recommend Dan McLaughlin's articles, but this time I particularly do. And um, you can't go around rummaging through the Constitution for fanciful powers. And uh, we'll be back in a moment. I, I think that, uh, I think that uh, just before we go, you can't rummage around for fanciful powers just because you don't want to do what the Constitution wants you to do. You've got to follow it, particularly when you, f you swore an oath. So we'll be right back. <laughs> 